Okay, we have, we've been discussing with the four of us, um, Ning, Miguel, Katie, and me, on the topics that we like to cover. And first of all, it's very technology focused. So that's also the item that we like to focus on. But I think it's good to maybe first give a short introduction to um, the services that we have with Secure Southeast Asia. So deep learning has become actually an integral part of the services that we develop. Here's an overview of uh, the services that we develop for Cambodia in the next five years. It's an update on an annual land cover and forest cover in Cambodia, um, an update on the rice map, an update on the rubber and cashew map. Uh, building a crop model for mango, pepper, and cassava. And also we have the protected alert system for expanding into other areas in Cambodia. So this is a system that we developed in the previous phase and which we're now going to expand for the whole of Cambodia. Um, so that's for Cambodia already five services where we actually integrate the deep learning methodologies um, for most of the services here. It's mostly CNN based um, for land cover classification purposes for the land cover maps, it's usually uh, relatively core scale, so landsat based uh, models, but it's interesting that with deep learning technologies, we also can map very specific crop types, uh, among which, for example, cashew, which is not possible uh, with traditional machine learning methodologies. Um, this is also the tool structure for uh, Burma. So we have also buy-in from the Burma mission. So we have many uh, activities currently in uh, Burma. And uh, one of the main activities there, so uh, we do the biophysical monitoring, the forest monitoring and the fire monitoring. But for crop mapping specifically, we uh, aim to map rice, maize, beans and pulses. Um, currently, we are using a random forest algorithm using Sentinel-1 Landsat and Planet Data, but we are also migrating that into deep learning methodologies. And with all those different services that we have, we run into some issues that we like to discuss with you today and also like to discuss with you um, during the Geo for Good meeting. Um, first of all is cost management. Um, this is an example of uh, the, the number of Sentinel-1 images that we have for uh, Cambodia. So the, the SAR alert system that we developed is using a convolutional neural network and Sentinel-1 imagery, and we basically construct a time series. And from that time series, we uh, detect forest disturbances. Uh, we developed it for a small protected area in Cambodia, uh, the Prey Lime Wildlife Sanctuary. So for relatively small areas, it's it's easy to integrate the service on the AI platform or now the Cortex AI platform. But when we start expanding to larger areas, you can see as uh, for the uh, total time series from 2014, we have 79 images. Um, so if you process that and the costs are around one cent per image, that uh, would be very nice. But oftentimes we notice that the costs are very much higher. So if, if we get up to uh, $1 or sometimes even $10 per image, then uh, processing becomes very, very expensive. And especially if you're at the $10 per image uh, rate, then it becomes impossible for us to uh, deploy such system at scale uh, on, the AI, on the AI platform. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to get more insights into the costs. Uh, we tested different models. So we tested models with uh, millions of parameters and also models with hundreds of millions of parameters. And then we tried to make a comparison in how much resources we used, but it's, um, uh, we didn't get a very consistent picture there, so if we can get more insight there, that would be really nice. Um, a second issue we're also interested in is continuous training. So what we are doing now is uh, we take the training data, we have, um, we train our model and that's our model and that's what we deployed and that's what we are using then for um, 
also for future tasks. Um, but uh, for example, with systems like the deforestation system, we also have a feedback loop where um, field data is collected by uh, different partners we work with in the country. So we are looking into systems that can um, basically where we have a model that whenever new training data becomes available, there's an easy way to uh, deploy that data into the machine learning method approach and then update the model and then use that model for uh, future predictions. Uh, for the forest alert system, for example, but also for the cashew mapping that we are doing, some of the data sets uh, that we generate, that we export from uh, Google Earth Engine are around 100, 150 gigabytes. So these data sets, especially when you um, want to use this continuous training methodologies, need to sit somewhere and uh, that can become very difficult. So we already have implemented some methods for generating uh, training data more on the fly, but we are interested to learn more about uh, other people that already have implemented similar systems and the specific methodologies that they're using. And if maybe specific libraries are available that can be used for this, this integration. And then the last question, the last topic that we are interested in is data management. Um, for many of the models that we operationalize on the AI platform or the Vertex AI platform, it's very simple. You just take an image or you take an image composite and you define the specific bands. So that's RGBN, uh, sometimes in near infrared, short infrared bands. And you just do uh, the inference on a single image but when you have more exotic uh, designs of your neural nets, this is um, the neural net, for example, that we're currently using for uh, crop type mapping in Cambodia. So for the people that are familiar with this typical uh, UNET uh, architecture at the highest level, uh, we have the planet scope imagery going in. So that's, that's for different channels, RGBN at the five meter resolution then um, after max pooling, we add the different layers for Sentinel-1 and for Sentinel-2. So for Sentinel-2, that's the RGBN uh, channels, which have a 10 meter spatial resolution, and also Sentinel-1, which has a 10 meter spatial resolution. And then after another iteration of max pooling, we also add the near infrared, short wave infrared channels at 20 meters from Sentinel-2 into the network. Um, and then we um, train the model in that way. but if we use the uh, implementation, which is currently available in uh, Google Earth Engine, this is very difficult because I don't know how we can organize the data structure inside Google Earth Engine in such a way that we can use um, the implementation that they built. Um, this is this is another an example of uh, a transformer-based model that we are also using for base mapping. Uh, we are currently testing it for Xi'an State in Myanmar, and we also like to use it for rise mapping because uh, this is actually a pixel-based algorithm. So um, what we do is we construct a time series, uh, usually using bi-weekly information or using monthly information from Planet and from Sentinel-1. And uh, then we use the transformer model to um, basically in the same way as we traditionally use a random forest model, so pixel-based approach, but what we can see is that if you use time sharing information and a transformer model, then uh, performance is uh, much better than using traditional uh, random forest model. But the data manipulations that are going in and out in using this model are quite complicated because we need to uh, basically take take the image path, then we need to do the conversion, then we get uh, a pixel-based NumPy array, then we can do the inference uh, per pixel, and then we need to reshape everything back into uh, a NumPy array, and then we can write it as, as a geotiff. Uh, this, this information is also used as input for another model, which is then a TensorFlow model, and then we come into the issue of um, 
uh, we also call it dependency hell is that many <laughs> that we have so many libraries that they start biting each other and that we get into uh, many issues there so what's what we currently do as a workflow is we use the GE Earth Engine High volume endpoint, and then we basically get the data to our um, server. We convert everything into a NumPy array, so we read out uh, the GeoTIFF. Uh, we first write it as a GeoTIFF patch, uh, then we read it out again as a NumPy array, and then we apply the model and we calculate the probability. We write it back as a GeoTIFF. We merge everything together. We bring it back to the Google Clouds. And then we upload it to the GE data catalog. But this whole part, which is outside Earth Engine being done at our uh, own server, is computationally quite intensive. So if we could use uh, Google technology, Google Cloud technology, to build this implementation inside uh, Google Earth Engine or maybe in, for example, Cloud Run, and run it is this in an efficient way um, that would resolve a lot of headache that we are currently having with uh, deploying the algorithms. And then we end with the conclusion slides. We don't have a conclusion yet. <laughs> I hope we can come to a nice conclusion during this year for good meeting. Very nice. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. So um, maybe we just do like, I don't know, like 10, five to 10 minutes of questions and sort of brainstorming um, from everything you've heard. We can go around the room if, if people have questions. Our solutions. Oh, yeah, or, or solutions, right? That's what you're looking for. So I'll, I'll yeah. just quickly start and kind of get the ball rolling. I, I mean, I think the fact that you guys are focusing on something that is on technical limitations, not on a not on a theme, like not on a particular service that you're trying to identify because you have existing services, right? So that I think it was really key to set the stage that, hey, we have five services, but we really run into these technical limitations. And I think maybe as part of this exchange, we find some Google folks and we sit them down and we sort of run through a litany of these challenges, right? Because what you're talking about is developing improved pipelines um and that are really really um sort of geared towards the application so um i've got a couple ideas on that and i see people chiming in let me see let me go to the chat real quick um yeah uh kevin asks what is the cheapest computational time on gee or on your server so which one is um i guess more efficient yeah for for us the server because the server is already paid for um but we don't have the scalability that Google has. And uh, it's it's difficult for us to get good insights into the exact costs, because I think for Google, it's also difficult to come up because they don't, uh, they don't know which specific uh, architecture we use. Um, they don't know what the input data is, what the output data is, um, et cetera. Um, but that makes it also very complicated for us also when we, for example, talk to partners, uh, when they ask for a quote on, okay, what would it cost if you develop this model and you deploy it on Google Earth Engine and we want to maintain it for uh, some years? It's, yeah, it's a difficult question to answer. Yeah, and Kevin, I'll add some thoughts there too. You know, something that Biplop and I are exploring is using Socrates and the GPU and some of the storage infrastructure there that all the hubs have access to. Um, so that could be a solution, but I'll tell you, bring up a really good point. There is, it seems as though there are different factions of Google that the cloud teams don't necessarily know what the Earth outreach groups are sort of doing in that way. And the cost sharing isn't really totally clear. So that might be something that we like actually sit down and sort of chat about. I know those are other discussions that we, we kind of hear about through Google, but we see the same thing. There's, it's not really clear as to, you know, if you run a job with a million parameters and if you do it with 2 million parameters, are you seeing a price increase or is it just based off the server or is it based off the time you run it or, or, and, or all these other elements. So um, that's a huge challenge. Um, any other questions on this? Yes, raised hand when we go to the queue. 
it's me. <laughs> uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> thanks, Ati, for the uh, great presentation. So I just said, uh, I don't know how you're doing your inferences, but the current way that Google recommends is using a Vertex AI instead of AI platform. Uh, and Vertex AI, uh, you can specify different machine type when you are doing those inferences. Uh, so uh, team and I ha are having this side conversation with Nick where we're running into similar issues where, you know, when we try to increase the number of parameters or try to increase the number of features, uh, in a machine learning model, those usually time out. And there are several issues that I think Google is still trying to figure that out because uh, they're just moving uh, it from a uh, Earth engine side, but it also has a back backend connector with the Vertex AI. And uh, so uh, I just shared this uh, machine type that you can specify. Uh, sometimes it uh, it's not about uh, like the higher and machine will give you, uh, you know, results. Uh, but sometimes it's it's more on the batch export from the Earth engine. For example, we're running some export at 10 meter, we didn't run, but then we had to revert back to 30 meters. Uh, that uh, ran successfully. Uh, on the other note, there's also some quota uh, that's linked to these cloud projects. And if you exit that quota, uh, if there's a throttle on the uh, machine that you're using, uh, then those usually timed out and you, you never get the export. Uh, so we don't know like whether they cast those results and when you run it again, uh, whether those results are succeed or not. But uh, yeah, we, we also have a lot of uh, questions around this and, uh, and uh, Nick has been very helpful uh, on that end, but uh, I think there's like a bigger machine learning team in, in, in the Google that works on this stuff. Uh, so it might be a really good idea to uh, get back to Nick and uh, hopefully have, you know, a few uh, hours of dedicated time on, I don't know, on Friday or Saturday and, and try to uh, pick their brain. That sounds good. Yeah. Is, is, is the connection between Vertex AI and Google Earth Engine, is that similar to what we just, what I described here? Yes, it's it's very similar. Uh, there's some uh, pre-processing that you need to do uh, before you can push your model into a Vertex AI uh, because they can only accept uh, base 64 encoding uh, data sets. But uh, if you have a trained model, then it's uh, pretty simple to load that model and then add those pre-processing layers on top of it to push that to an Earth engine, oh, sorry, to a Vertex AI, and then make a direct call from the Earth engine. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I have a question on this slide, the one that you're saying here, actually. Uh, so, uh, from what you said, so you're trying to get those data out from Earth Engine and then uh, run model on those data outside the Earth Engine, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, can you like uh, go in detail on how you're actually getting those data out of Earth Engine? Are you using batch export to get them in GeoTIFF or? Um, so when I, what basically do is we built a grid over the area of interest. So if it's an image, we have some code to build the grid over the image. Um, then there is a limit on the amount of transport, the data you can transport. So usually it's around, let's say, um, 512 by 512 patches that we export. Um, those, that's something we usually run in parallel. And then we store them just on the hard disk as GeoTIFFs because we know the format, so we know the bounding box, so that's, that information can be used to store them as GeoTIFFs, so we end up with sometimes 10,000 GeoTIFFs. Um, then there is the process of running the model. Uh, we can run the model using the, uh, just opening the patch and then running, uh, reading it as a NumPy array, feeding it through the model, and then we have the output patch. We need to make sure that we get it in the same format as the input patch. So there's some data management in between. Um, and that is then stored again. And it's usually probabilities or classification. And then we do just a GDAL merge to bring it back into an image. And then we 
move it to uh, Google Cloud and then we apply it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think there's a better way uh, you can do this. Uh, especially now that it's connected to Vertex AI. Uh, Nick recently shared a Medium blog. Uh, I think it's called Pixel to People on where they are trying to uh, encourage people to use compute pixels and uh, AI, uh, and get pixels. Uh, on, on a side note, um, there's a, another project that I'm working on where you know, there, we have this R model that's trained in um, R, and then uh, we have this trained model, but we want to run the predict on the entire conus. Uh, but we're starting with California, and uh, in, in this context, I'm using uh, REST API from the Earth Engine that uh, could get all those data out of the Earth Engine. Uh, the uh, the issue that I'm running into is uh, there's only at certain pixel that I can get those data out. Uh, you know, otherwise it it again goes back into this computation time out uh, issue. So, uh, if if your area of interest is small, maybe maybe try to look in uh, REST EE uh, mm -hmm. on the Earth Engine side uh, that. Uh, that natively use the get pixels uh, or the compute pixels on the back end. So you might be able to uh, get a larger portion of data and try maybe automate those without having to switch different platform. Uh, and on the, it's, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Is the, the high, uh, what, what I described here as the G high kernel endpoint. That's is a, that the same? That's as the REST API, or is that something different? Uh, that that's a different one. Uh, so uh, I think KL uh, developed a uh, API uh, uh, Python uh, package on top of that. I can share that quickly here. Uh, but if you're trying to also get those uh, sample data out, not the entire image base, but the sample on those data out, you could also try using Apache Beam, which could uh, paralyze many of those processing really fast. Uh, so. Uh, Tim and I have been working on these uh, again on using Senti uh, sorry uh, planet uh, for rice mapping in uh, in Bhutan and trying to explore uh, some of these newer functionality and technology that Google have been putting out and here's an example on how you can use some of these Apache Beam I just shared a link I'm developing a larger module uh, that. Uh, would be more generic and people can use it, but it's a work in progress and hopefully by Geo for Good, I'll have that uh, ready and uh, have some demo so people can use it. But you can easily use some of these uh, Apache Beam to parallelize some of this processing. And in, if in the process you're getting timeout error, some of those timeout error is also handled by, by these scripts. Uh, that sounds great, yeah. And in terms of the Vertex AI, um, one, one of the problems I run into is when I use that API, it's basically you're blind in terms of getting your data in, getting your data out. Uh, so if you put it in the correct format, it works. But if you have something exotic, uh, you, you don't know what to do because you don't know how it accepts the data. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think if uh, maybe um, uh, I'll reach out to you separately, uh, and if we if we get those um, thoughts on on a piece of paper or on a document, then it would be easier to reach out to Nick as a group and have those session separately for us. That sounds great. Yeah, I was just going to try and hunt down that sit and learn uh, presentation we did after Geo for Good that goes through that um, Apache Beam also. That's another good resource. Um, just to think about time also on, you know, developing sort of the research questions that you've got right now, I feel like they're great. Thinking about maybe how do we take advantage of the time that we've got all together to sort of showcase sort of the deficit of what you guys are running into, and that way we can make a good case uh, you know, we can talk with Nick and all and everyone in the lead up, but it'd be really interesting to sort of test these different methods and see where the sort of the breakpoints are, because I would imagine they're going to be really res responsive to some of the ways in which we're trying to, you know, connect all these pipes and seeing the limitations there. So maybe there's something we can talk offline on sort of design, you know, like, for instance, uh, Biplob shared that um, 
uh, Google link with all the different machines. And we're kind of testing like really small machines, big machines, everything, and trying to do these exports. And we haven't really cataloged that, but that might be something we want to explore with all of these different questions that, you know, in theory, it's supposed to work this way, but there's still a lot of limitations trying to get back into Earth Engine. So, um, you know, something to think about on sort of the design, um, and we can sort of approach that while we're there. Um, so great. I, I, I don't want to cut anyone off if there's any more questions because this is a fantastic presentation. I'll go one more round if anyone's got any more questions. Oh, I think that's it. Bob again. Oh, okay. oh yeah, same bug issue. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for all the feedback also for the people in the chat. That's extremely useful.